Next, on the OHIO Podcast, the Wild Man joins Buckeye Boggs to rank the top 10 former Buckeyes who are in the coaching industry. We discuss the recent controversy surrounding Marcus Freeman. They introduce the Mount Rushmore of Ohio State football from the 1960s, and they rank the top 10 returning quarterbacks in the Big Ten. Plus, listener Eric Osbeck joins us to preview Ohio State's 2022 schedule, and that all starts right now. It's so easy to be average. You know it as well as I know it. It takes a little something to be special, Don. It takes a little something special to be a great player. We don't have enough great players. To hell with that! We don't want to coach average. I don't want to be around you. Why be around average? proud of our young people in the classroom, in the community, and most especially in 310 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the football field. Three things. Number one, the team that hits the hardest and the longest, the team that starts the fastest, and the team is too damn smart to make mistakes. If you take it to them, if you don't make mistakes, and you keep taking it to them, hell, there's no question who win. It's time for the best Buckeye podcast. By fans, for the fans. Where they hate that team up north as much as you do. It's time for the OHIO Podcast. OHIO! Welcome back to the OHIO Podcast, everybody. I'm your host, Buckeye Boggs, recording live from a beautiful, sunny, but kind of cool, believe it or not, North Central Ohio. I am joined by my co-host, Chris Wilds. Wild man, what would you think about this weather this weekend, man? Almost football weather. Oh, man, this has been beautiful this weekend. Give me this all summer long. I'm loving it, you know, got out, uh, didn't get out golfing today, which is one of the things I wanted to do, but you know, got out, got to do some yard work, you know, did, did a, you know, a little bit of a pop-up sale out, uh, selling some of my goodies and, uh, you know, it, it's been, it's been a nice weekend. Beautiful. It has been and happy father's day to you and happy father's day to all of you out there who are listening to this. Hope that you had a great weekend, all you dads out there. If you're not satisfied with pickup games and unranked matches, chances are you're aiming higher than most. At Spire, you'll train to be the best. Whether you're drawn to the pool, track, mat, basketball, court, or gaming controller, we provide the training you need to achieve your dream. Make our facilities your home or take advantage of free transportation services. Are you ready to unlock your potential? Visit SpireCleveland.com today. All right, let's talk about former Buckeyes, Chris, who are in the coaching ranks. Uh, I put a list together. I sent a call out to, to help and got a couple uh, former Buckeyes I didn't know were still in the coaching ranks. Thank you to all you who participated on our social media sites uh, and, and gathering this list together. Uh, about 14, 15 guys that we had here that um, are are out there in the coaching ranks. And I'm sure there are more we just don't know about, Chris. But we are going to rank from 10 to 1 former Buckeyes who are coaching when and basically on on a scale of on who's the most significant out there or the doing the best job, I guess is the best way we'll put that. Um, that's kind of how I looked at it, Chris. I'm not really sure how you came up with your list, but I will uh, let you begin with number ten and we'll work our way down. How about that? Well, sounds good to me. <clears throat> at number ten, you know, I went with with, with the guy who. You know, I went with Devin Jordan. Uh, you know, he doesn't have any head coaching experience, obviously. He was the quality control guy on offense for the uh, University of Akron. Uh, he is now back with us as a graduate assistant. Um, a lot of the relevance goes with the job. You know, you're a former Ohio State receiver. You're now a, a graduate assistant for Ohio State on the offense. Um, he seems to have done well at Akron, so... Time's going to tell, and I think it's going to tell with a lot of these guys that we're going to talk about today, Eric, because a lot of these guys are early on in their coaching careers, um, so it's been kind of hard to, to grade them, but I went with Jordan at number 10. 
Number 10 for me is Pepe Pearson, uh, who is the running backs coach at TSU or Tennessee State University for Eddie, for one Eddie George. So Pepe Pearson, who obviously had a good running backs, uh, good running, good career at Ohio State at running back. I think he had a decent NFL career, Chris. I had to go back and try to remind myself of what he did in the NFL. Um, but he's dipping his toe in the coaching ranks. I think he's getting a good start there in Tennessee with Eddie George, you know, two Buckeye legends at the running back position there. I expect the running game at T- uh, TSU to be pretty good down there in Tennessee. We'll see what, how his career expands beyond this uh, or if he's going to just kind of follow uh, Eddie George and step there. How about number nine, Chris? Well, I'll tell you what, number nine for me uh, actually is another guy just getting his coaching career started, but I love the energy, and that's James Laurinaitis. You know, he hasn't proven it as coach yet, so I had a hard time putting him up there further. But I think this guy is going to be, uh, excuse the pun here, but a little animal when it comes to recruiting (laughs) and when it comes to getting his guys pumped on the field. Uh, He just hasn't proven it yet, and that's why I couldn't bring him up any higher than that. But I've got Lauren Itis in at nine. Yeah, I could. I, di- I didn't put him on my list for that exact reason, Chris. But I will say this. I'm still a little bit bitter that Ohio State did not give him the same opportunity. Oh, I agree. And, and, I, and I'm not bitter with Lauren Itis for dipping his toe in the coaching pool. I'm better with Ohio State for not taking advantage, especially after we parted ways with Washington. Right. And I and he let it he let it be known he wanted to coach for Ohio State. And for some reason, they just didn't think he had any experience and therefore he wasn't going to work. But then here comes Marcus Freeman, who played with him uh, back under Trestle and said, hey, come be at Notre Dame. And of course, he went. So hopefully we'll if he if he is successful, we'll be able to steal him back. Number nine for me is a former quarterback, Joe Germain, the baby faced assassin from Arizona. He is coaching out west in Arizona for Mountain View High School, uh, which is where he went to high school, believe it or not. So he's coaching at his alma mater. I don't know if he has any aspirations to go beyond high school. I he I view him as kind of like a family guy who's like, you know what? I get to coach football. I'm coaching it in my hometown at my alma mater. Like life is good for me, you know, type of thing. Like I just don't know if he's the type of guy who is going to push beyond this. But I, if we ever needed a quarterbacks coach, I, he'd be my first call, Chris. Yeah, I can't disagree. I think he's a he's a great option. You know, I didn't have him in my top ten strictly because of, like you said, he's out of high school. I don't know if he has aspirations to go further. But if you talk about this guy, I mean. Think of him like Triple H in, in the WWE, man. This guy's a cerebral assassin. He is yeah. very intellectual, very smart guy. You know, he's kind of like Bill Belichick with a personality. So. <laughs> a little, little dry. A little dry, but uh, yeah, I, I think he's a great mind. So number eight for me then. So number eight for me, I actually went here with Pepper Johnson of the T- uh, Tampa Bay Bandits. Um and not so much for what he's done with Tampa Bay because he is going into his first year as defensive coordinator there at Tampa Bay. But I'll tell you, I saw the way when he was in Cleveland that he brought along the younger linebackers, and you can see that the coaching talent is there. The mindset is there. I think he's going to be a good one. I've got him in at number eight. Uh, I do as well, so I'm not going to reiterate that. Everything you said Good backgrounds, coached in all levels, and is back in the USFL and at a professional level, and you know, just kind of, kind of, kind of intrigued that we just never saw him at Ohio State. You know, just interesting. Uh, number seven, Chris. Now, for me, this is actually where I slide in Pepe Pearson. Um, I like his experience. Uh, like you said, he's he's coached kind of all over the place a little bit. Good career as a running back in college. Decent career in the pros. I also had the benefit of watching, and he was a coach here in Marion at one time. He coached our arena football team here in Marion. And it it was not a good team before he took it over, and he really turned it around. And again, this is not high-level football, but at the same time, anytime you can make that kind of an impact on a team, I think you're a coach worth having. I'm going to be at number seven. Number seven for me is... 
Do you like smooth jazz any, Chris? Oh, I love me a little bit of smooth jazz. Yeah, I like smooth jazz. That's Kenny Guyton. Uh, he has really made a name for himself in the coaching ranks. Uh, started out in Houston and um, is now currently currently the wide receivers coach at Arkansas. And this is a little tease. If Brian Hartline ever becomes the offensive coordinator, I would not be surprised if Kenny Guyton slides over to Columbus to be the new wide receivers coach. Yeah, I, I can't disagree with you. Uh, I think he's a great coach. I actually had him in at number 11. Mm. But, uh, you know, I do think he's a great mind, a great coach. Um, I just want to see more out of him. Gotcha. So number six for me, and, and you can call me a bit of a homer here. Of course, these guys are all our guys, but, uh, you know, I got Tim Walton in here. Mm-hmm. Um, I like what he's done coming into Ohio State so far. He brings in that NFL experience. Uh, I think he's already made a bit of an impact as far as uh, recruiting goes. I think he's going to be a tremendous asset for us. I've got Walton in at six. I do as well. Ditto. So I'm not going to reiterate this. I got Walton at six as well, and I'm looking. At, I'm really looking forward to him. Uh, building this back end of this defensive uh, backfield for us, man. So yeah. I, I think he's going to do a great job. Number five, Chris. Number five, I got the Heisman, man. I got Eddie George <laughs> in there at five. Uh, you know, in his first season at TSU, they only went five and six. But it was the best season the school had had since 2017. Wow. I think the guy really has, again, I think he's got the mind for it. And – you know what? I could see him throwing on the pads and going out there and hitting those guys if they weren't doing it right. <laughs> but uh, no, I, th- I think he's going to be a tremendous success. Yes, five and six in his first year. But you know who else was one game under 500 their first year? Luke Fickle. He wasn't mm-hmm. didn't turn out to be too bad. No, he's he's. He's a pretty high on my list, you could Mine say. Mine as well, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm with you again, man. Eddie George, number five. Here we go. We're we're marching in step with each other. Um, love the love the guy again. I don't know what his dreams and aspirations are as a coach. This guy, whatever he puts his heart and mind to, he's successful. Dude yes. was on Broadway, Chris. Okay, like oh, he's I been mean, on TV acting. He's been on Broadway. He's he's everywhere he wants to be. Yeah, so I I would not be surprised if TSU ends up becoming a pretty pretty big powerhouse down there uh, in the lower level, and and that I wonder if what that'll translate to for him in his career. I, I kind of got a my I got one eye on him, if you know what I mean. I'm following that Absolutely. very closely. Number four for you, pal. Well, at number four, I've got the mouth. <laughs> Me too. Got Marcus Freeman <laughs> at number four. Solid defensive coordinator under, let's let's face it, under a defensive-minded head coach in Luke Fickle. Yet to be proven as a head coach. Um, and I'm just going to leave it there because i got a lot to say about Marcus Freeman a little bit later. Me as well. I've actually uh, got a lot to say about him. So we'll, hold, we'll, we'll uh, hold those comments for a few minutes. Number three, uh, of course, I, was, I had Freeman number four as well. Number three, Chris. I mean, these top three guys to me are no-brainers. The only question is, is where you have them compared to me. So lay it on me, man. Well, I'll tell you right now, and, and the only reason I've got him in at number three is because he's not a head coach. Yeah. And that's Brian Hartline. Yeah, me as well. I mean, you look at what he's done recruiting and developing that Ohio State wide receiver room. You know, the old adage is we don't, you know, we don't rebuild, we reload. We don't even reload anymore, Eric. It just happens. We do, They just come. <laughs> is Brian Hartline possibly, hear me out, the greatest recruiter who is not a head coach in college football history? Oh, I don't think there's a doubt. I don't think there's any doubt. You look at what he's done in recruiting and not just recruiting the receivers, but he's got his hands in other recruits as well, you know? So, yeah, I think absolutely this guy is the best recruiter to not be a head coach. Yeah, I agree, which means you probably have an NFL coach at number two. Am I right? Huh. We are in lockstep period yep. because, yeah, I got Mike Vrabel at number two. You know, 41-24 as a head coach in the NFL. 
was no, had the number one seed in the uh, AFC last year. And he's doing all this with Ryan Tannehill, who is not exactly what you would call a top tier quarterback. <laughs> no, uh, you know, he's great. Again, like a lot of these guys, great defensive mind um, has that experience. Just, I think he's going to be a tremendous NFL head coach for a lot of years. Rumor mill here. You ready for this? Yeah. Mike Vrabel is willing to sell his soul to get CJ Stroud on his team next year. Oh, I have no doubt. He loves that kid. And I have no doubt. Yeah. He, if, if Tennessee does not have a good year, he will do everything in his power to trade up to get CJ Stroud, mark it down. Well, I'll tell you right now, <clears throat> if they don't have a good year, this could, you know, because this happens in the NBA and in the NFL. If they don't start out strong, you could see them tank just to get them. It, it, it's, it's a very real possibility. I, would, I wouldn't doubt it. Which means number one is the Fickmeister down there in UC and then in the Queen City. Yeah, absolutely. He, he brought that team to relevance, Eric. 54-22 and 22 as a head coach. And that was with really a tough first two years. Six and seven at Ohio State as an interim coach. Four and eight at first year at Cincy. Since then, all he's done is go 11 and 2, 11 and 3, 9 and 1, 13 and 1. He led Cincy to their first college football playoff, uh, which, by the way, was the first ever for a group of five. He went toe to toe with Georgia in the Peach Bowl a few years ago. Yeah, th- this guy is, again, just like Vrabel. He can write his own ticket. I think he's going to do, you know, stay at the college level to do it, whereas I see Vrabel staying in the pros. But I think Fickle, uh, you know, it's just a matter of time when Day retires that this guy is the head coach of the Buckeyes again. He has turned down coach on coaching offers to Michigan State not once but twice. He has turned down coaching offers, I believe, to Pitt as one yes. uh, as another school. Um, and of course, I think there was some rumors about some of the SEC schools flirting around with him as well as some Big Twelve schools. And he has stayed true to Cincinnati. And um, I tell you what, man, I, I think Luke Fickle is a type of person. He's very similar to Ryan Day and his family being a family man and structure and, and not wanting to disrupt the life of his children. And I know he and his wife, um, I believe they have like five or six kids. Like they have a lot of children. Yeah. So, um yeah, I agree with you. I think Luke Fickle is probably there until since until Ohio State comes calling again. But I got a question for you, Chris. What would it take for Mike Vrabel to leapfrog Luke Fickle and become number one on this list for you? A Super Bowl. Yeah, me too. It's that simple. Yeah. He goes out and he wins a Super Bowl, especially if he does it with Ryan Tannehill. Yeah, he he jumps the he he jumps Fick. Other yeah. than that, that's about the only thing that would do it for me. Very good. I like it. So number four on this list was Marcus Freeman. Let's talk about him. He has not been able to keep his mouth shut. Uh, he keeps talking about Ohio State. He's walked back his comments this week when he joined Bobby Carpenter in Columbus, Ohio, on the radio station, The Juice. I wrote an article about him. I don't know if you got a chance to read that article I wrote. Um, I was pretty um, – bold in what I was saying uh, about what he is has come out and said. If you're unfamiliar with what he has done, he came out and basically said that at Notre Dame, you can't cheat academics. You have to go to class, unlike other places where I have been. Well, the only other two places he's been is Cincinnati and Ohio State. So who do you think he's talking about there, right? Uh, so he throws his alma mater under the bus. The, this was after comments that he had said earlier in an earlier interview back when he got hired about not wanting to make the same mistake twice, meaning he did not want to uh, shun Notre Dame like he did when he was recruited to Columbus, Ohio by Jim Trestle to be a Buckeye, basically saying he made the wrong mistake by being a Buckeye over, over being a, a fighting Irish golden, golden domer in Notre Dame. That being said, Chris, I know what he's doing is he understands that Ohio State is his main competition when it comes to recruiting in the Midwest. And so he's he has to promote his school if you're going to compete against Ryan Day 
on the recruiting front. And Notre Dame has done, been doing very well, uh, actually, in the 2023 class. They are ranked number one in the country right now in recruiting. Now, I do believe Ohio State was going to be able to catch him, especially this week when we hear about a five-star who's making his announcement tomorrow in Carnell Tate, and I believe he's going to be a Buckeye. I believe he's going to commit to us. That's going to boost us big time. But man alive, dude, like you should have more respect for your alma mater. Now, I've got some comments, but I want to hear yours first, Chris. So I just wanted to set the table for you on what Marcus Freeman is saying that's upsetting Buckeye Nation. Well, let me tell you, Eric, all Marcus Freeman has done since becoming the head coach at Notre Dame is make himself look like a complete ass. And honestly, I believe he's ruining any chances he may have had of coming back to the Buckeyes as a head coach or a coordinator in the future. I really do. Honestly, I think we all know that, yeah, some liberties sometimes get extended to athletes, but it doesn't mean that they don't attend class. You know, Ohio State is first and foremost a university. It's an institute of higher learning. If you don't attend class in one fashion or another, you don't graduate. I mean, Eric, in today's environment, let's face it, online classes are a fact of life. Is he questioning the validity of the online classes? Because that's kind of what it sounded like a little bit. Yeah. Is he saying that, you know, my degree isn't valid because my program that I'm doing my master's in through Ohio State happens to be an online program? So does that mean I mean, the degree's uh, invalid for everybody who had to attend online courses for two years because of COVID? Well, I, I was just getting to that. It's like, you know, on August 19th of 2020, Notre Dame canceled all in-person classes due to the pandemic. So by his standards, does that mean the players should be ineligible and they throw out the 2020 season? Or how about the 2020 season that the University of Cincinnati had? Because you know what? That's what put them on the map. When they came out there and culminated that season in that, uh, that uh, Peach Bowl game, against Georgia, that's, that was what really put Fickle and Freeman on the map big time. Right. And, and are we going to invalidate that because of the fact that those guys had to intend, attend class online? I mean, now I know in recent days he's come out and he's you know said he's misquoted. He's been misunderstood. He's trying to step it back. Well, first of all, if Bobby Carpenter's grilling me, I'm going to tell him whatever he wants to hear because that guy is scary. <laughs> right. But you know what? He, he's trying to walk it back by saying he's proud of his degrees and he would never disparage a university. Well, guess what, Skippy? That's exactly what the hell you just did. <laughs> you basically called out your alma mater and for what? Now, Eric, I am sure, I am sure 100% that this was gamesmanship. This was a little something to get inside of the Ohio State players' heads, their coaches' heads, the fans. Maybe it's to hype the game. Maybe it's like you said, to to enhance recruiting. But, yeah, he went way too far. You don't bite the hand that you hope someday going to feed you. And let's face it, if you went to Ohio State, whether you want to admit it or not, you hope to be back there on that coaching staff someday. You hope to be in that position that Ryan Day is in. You know, he was part of maybe a two- or three-man race for the top job in Ohio if Ryan Day decided to leave, and he just pissed that away. Mm -hmm. I don't think that – you know, he stands a chance at that right now. Uh, Eric, you know as well as I do in today's area, era of social media, everything you do, you say, or you post follows you for the rest of your life. I think this stays for free, with Freeman for a long time. I think he screwed up royally. I think he, he has blown his shot with Ohio State. Marcus Freeman could have had the love of not one but two schools. Ohio State fans would have cheered for him. As long as the Buckeyes were not playing the Irish, much like we do for like much like we do for Lick Fickle, Chris. But not anymore, man. Freeman has become the enemy, hated second only to that clown who resides in Ann Arbor. At this point, the fact that Freeman once called Ohio State home has forever been stained. He will no longer be welcomed back to Columbus with open arms or have throngs of fans cheering for him to come home to be the defensive coordinator or even the head coach if he were to succeed in South Bend. Freeman has permanently excommunicated himself from Buckeye Nation. Come September 3rd, mark it down, 100,000 plus will be raining boos down upon the Irish and Marcus Freeman. Yes, those boos will become, well, will be because you ain't us, but believe you me, Chris, for the majority of us, 
those boos will be directed towards Marcus Freeman. He better be, be lucky or feel lucky that all of that's going to be raining down on him is booze. Because let me tell you, if we got some of our alumni from Cleveland coming down, we know how to throw some stuff. <laughs> In the same vein as Will Smith at the Oscars, I got to say this. Keep Ohio State's name out of your mouth. <laughs> Amen. You no longer deserve the admiration of this fan base, and you deserve the beating that's coming your way on September 3rd, Mr. Freeman. That's how I ended my article. So uh, I, I, am, I am very much looking forward to this game. And in and, and my opinion, next to Jim Hairball, he's the next most hated guy right there with Nick Satan. So good job. Good job, Marcus Freeman. Way to go, buddy. Keep it classy. <laughs> Way to keep it classy. That's right. All right, man. Enough Marcus Freeman talk. Let's move on to the Mount Rushmore of the 1960s. And I made a boo-boo last show, Chris, because I thought the 1960s was going to be super simple. But here's the problem with the 60s. Yeah. The 1968 national championship team that had the super softs, they all graduated in the 70s, in 1970. So that really hamstrung me as I'm trying to come up with this list because I'm thinking you got still uh still wagon you got uh Rex Kern uh you got the assassin uh uh Jack Tatum back there all those guys yeah. no you don't no those are set night those are going to be in the 70s so I'm like oh the 70s is going to be with a, a few nightmare pretty to good other players there too yeah so anywho Let's go ahead and and try to knock out a Mount Rushmore for the 1960s, shall we? <clears throat> How about we start with Mr. Jim Otis? Led the team in rushing in 1967, 68, and 69. He was a unanimous All-American in 1969, was in the Varsity O Hall of Fame class of 1996, and was on the 1968 National Championship team. Jim Otis on Mount Rushmore, Chris, I think he's there. Oh, he's there. He's there, and you know who's right beside him, Eric? Who's that? Paul Warfield from 61 to 63. Now, you know, everybody thinks of Paul Warfield and what a great receiver he was in the NFL. But let's not forget, we, we didn't throw the ball a whole lot back then. But you know what? Warfield got himself 196 carries for 1,047 yards and eight touchdowns, averaging 5.3 yards per carry. He also had 39 catches for 525 and six touchdowns. He was two times all Big Ten. He's in Ohio State's Hall of Fame. He's in the Cleveland Browns Ring of Honor. He's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and he is on my Mount Rushmore. You know what? I didn't have him, but you know what? I'm putting him on there right now. You're right. I don't know how I overlooked Paul Warfield here. You're absolutely right. He's in there. How about Bob Ferguson? Is he on yours? Oh, yeah. He, he's number three on mine. Yeah. Led the team in rushing as a sophomore in 1959. Um, that was because freshmen weren't eligible to play. So that's why he uh, was a sophomore in 1959. But and let's 19 not forget, he supplanted a Heisman Trophy candidate to get that in Bob White. Yes. And in 1960 and 61, as a junior and senior, Ferguson was a unanimous All-American selection both years. In 61, he won the UPI College Football Player of the Year. He won the Maxwell Award that year, and he was runner-up for the Heisman to one Ernie Davis. Yeah. The That's 19- somebody we've talked about a little. Yeah, and the 1961 Heisman vote at that time, Chris, was the second closest in the history of the award, with Davis only edging out Ferguson by only 53 points. Bob Ferguson is definitely on that Mount Rushmore. Who's your number four? Well, for me, I went over to defense and give me a little bit of linebacker. Let's talk about some Ike Kelly. Yeah. 1963 to 65, two time All Big Ten, captain of the 65 team. I got Ike Kelly on there as my fourth. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I chose Ike Kelly over David Foley for one reason. He was a two time All American. Yes. Foley was team captain in 69 uh, on the 69 national championship team. He was a unanimous all American in 1968 that same year. But you know, Ike Kelly had two seasons of being an all American. And that just, that just shows you that you, you did well enough as a sophomore to go into that season, to be recognized to where people were going to look at you. And then you had two years of that. So yeah, I'm with you. I chose Ike Kelly over David Foley 
But uh, I agree with you. Paul Warfield needs to be in there. So that means Jim Otis, Paul Warfield, Bob Ferguson, and Ike Kelly is our Mount Rushmore of the 1960s. Not a bad class there, Chris. Not too bad. No, uh, they can play on my team anytime. Yeah, but I I know for a fact next week is going to be oh. it's going to be difficult, man. Yeah. The yeah, 70s it's be tough. the 70s had about enough guys to make three Mount Rushmores that would be better Easily. than the 60s, 50s, and 40s have been. So yeah, that's going to be tough. Does, does Does Archie get one spot or two? Because one of- spot. He only has to get. He only gets one. Yes. Yeah. Can't okay. have two. But yeah, I I, I don't know. Again. It's going to be crazy how to try to determine how we're going to do this, but it should be a lot of fun. All right, so we've been uh, previewing the upcoming season and in the Big Ten and for Ohio State. Um, And so we're going to continue that by talking about one more offensive position. And, of course, this is the one, probably the most fun one to talk about, and that is the top ten quarterbacks in the Big Ten. Now, Chris – I don't know of a conference that has as much returning starters as the Big Ten does at the quarterback position. We have a lot of transfers as well. We do have a few transfers, yes. But those transfers were also starters yes. in other teams and other conferences. I mean, I'm looking at this list. and This, this I, is a power list. Even even the lower end isn't bad. I I'm going to say that next year's NFL draft – the majority of quarterbacks will be from the Big Ten. I can see that. I, I really I really think that. Yeah, you're going to have the quarterback from Bama who's going to go high with C.J. Stroud. You're probably going to have one or two more from the SEC, probably one or two from the Big 12, one or two from – but I'm telling you, I could see seven, eight guys from the Big Ten get drafted next year. At, from yeah, the you'll only see a couple go early, but you'll see – You'll see seven or eight guys who are going to be on NFL rosters. So that being said, trying to make this list was incredibly difficult, man. Like I'm sitting here thinking, and I and I changed it three times, Chris, before we started recording. So I doubt we're going to be lock and step, and I cannot wait to see how and where you put M- M- McNamara and or McCarthy in this list because I I'll be honest, I put them together. I made them. Work. I think you have to. You have to because you don't know. My gut exactly, is, <laughs> and we'll get into it more. But my gut yeah. is that McNamara starts. I just don't know if he finishes. Exactly. I am right there with you. All right. Uh, I'll start this list this time, Chris. Um, number okay. ten for me, and I can make an argument that he doesn't belong on this list, but just because he's a returning starter for a, a team that played in the Big Ten championship game i had to put spencer petrus on this list somewhere here we go <laughs> you got him at number 10 too i do you? yeah 165 completions 288 attempts only 1880 yards 10 touchdowns and nine interceptions that's those are putrid stats in today's game chris now i understand iowa is a running team but they don't they don't have the same running attack that they had in the past it's time for Spencer Peters to step up and lead this team. If Iowa has any chance, and I don't think they do, but if they have any chance to get back to Indianapolis in 2022, it's been, it's going to be because of the arm of Spencer Peters, and he's only number 10 on my list. I don't think Iowa's going to get back there. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, Peters is solid by 1970s standards with his He's okay. Yards. He's okay. The big problem with Petrus is he turns the ball over. Yes. If he did not turn the ball over, I think that I would have a little more respect for him at this point than number 10, given that he is a junior and he, uh, you know, he's had a pretty good, pretty good uh, year last year outside of the turnovers. Yep. Okay. Number nine for me, since you had Spencer Petrus at number 10 as well, number nine for me, this guy should be higher on this list. I remember when he made his debut, I think it was on a Thursday night on the Big Ten Network against Illinois, and Graham Mertz threw the football all over the place. And I thought, "Uh uh-oh, Wisconsin has found their answer at quarterback. They're going to be dangerous. (laughs) Ever since that game, he's thrown up all over himself, Chris. He's not the guy that Ryan Day was recruiting. And, boy, I bet he wishes – 
he would have taken the opportunity to come to Ohio State and get developed by Ryan Day because this kid has gone backwards. 169 completions on 284 attempts, only 1,958 yards, 10 interceptions or 10 touchdowns to 11 interceptions. That's not good. Uh, Wisconsin basically abandoned the passing game and strictly ran, went to the running game. And if you look at their wide receivers this year, I don't think Graham Mertz is going to have a better year, quite frankly. I just don't I just don't see it happening. I got Graham Mertz at number nine. And again, I you could t- you could make the argument that he doesn't even need to be on this list. See, I've got him in at number nine as well, Eric. And let me tell you, I do think he's going to have a bit of a bounce back year. I think Skylar Bell, the freshman, is coming on strong. He looked good in spring ball. You know, they've got a solid, very solid running game up there. Wisconsin always has a good defensive line. I think that he comes back. I think he's probably not back to what we expected. But I can see him completing 63 to 65% of his passes, 2,500 yards, 15 touchdowns. He's not going to be huge, but I think that he'll he'll have a bounce back here and be better. Number eight for me is one of those transfers you talked about. Casey Thompson. Uh, I think he transferred from Texas. Texas. He's now the starting quarterback for the Cornhuskers and Frosty there in Nebraska. His numbers in Texas last year, 165 completions on 261 attempts for only 2,113 yards. But listen to this. He had 24 touchdowns, the nine interceptions. So more than doubled his interceptions uh, with he did there with the touchdowns. He's a pretty athletic guy. And if there's one thing about Nebraska – they have been in um, they've been in so many games they have they have developed new ways they've invented new ways to lose football games by one score chris if if casey thompson can bring a little bit of luck to nebraska then maybe he can save scott frost's job but this feels like a hail mary to me uh he going down to texas and grabbing this guy and hoping that he can turn things around for you there in lincoln i got casey thompson number 8 but i know some people are kind of higher on him I'm one of those people, and I'll talk about him a little bit more in a couple minutes. Uh, Number eight, I've got Tanner Morgan from Minnesota. Morgan's a fifth-year senior, had his best year in 2019, but he's been fairly solid at Minnesota every season. Uh, He has a great trio of running backs, which is going to take a lot of the pressure off of him. A couple decent wide receivers and a solid offensive line, but he has, I think, a great game planner in PJ Fleck, Mm -hmm. who I think is going to be an advantage for him should have a decent season. I could see 63%, maybe 3000 yards, 20 touchdowns out of him uh, this season. I think the Gophers contend for the West this year um, based on the, the running game and what I think Tanner Morgan can provide as far as stability at quarterback. Number seven, here is our state up North dilemma. I have Kate McNamara here. But I put slash J.J. McCarthy because like you, Chris, I don't know that McNamara finishes the year as the starter in Ann Arbor. If there's one thing about that team up north that I think is is their weak link, it's at quarterback. Now, I know Cade McNamara is a gamer, and he kind of puts me in mind a little bit of J.T. Barrett as far as like leadership skills and, and a heart and desire to win. But, but he didn't have the, the athletic skills. But on the big stage, I mean, you saw it against Georgia. The dude was completely unmatched. I yeah. mean, it's a different level up there. Um, and so I think that at some point this season, if McNamara stumbles, you're going to see that fan base turn on Harbaugh and call for McCarthy. And I think Harbaugh's not afraid to pull the trigger on that this year. He knows what he has in McCarthy. The only way that kid is going to is going to show if he can lead you to another Big Ten title and back to the college football playoff is if you throw him in the deep end and let him swim. He's either going to sink or swim. You can't do it the way you've been doing it. Um, so we'll see. McNamara's numbers, 210 of 327 attempts, 2,500 yards, 15 touchdowns, six picks. Um, I think McCarthy can actually do better than that. And I tell you, as a Buckeye fan – I, McCarthy puts more fear in me than McNamara ever does. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't, I don't agree. And if there's one thing we know, crazy Jimmy won't hesitate to pull the trigger. I've got him in, in that same spot, Eric. Um, because I just think it's too unpredictable. Uh, I think that 
McNamara does, as I said, get the nod to start the season. I think that the one thing that could save McNamara and keep McCarthy on the bench a little longer is McNamara is going to benefit from a very soft schedule. Yes. A very good run game and a pretty solid offensive line. They've got a pretty good receiving group up there who can make him look good. But I'm with you. I think if he starts to falter at all, Harbaugh won't hesitate to pull the trigger and switch. And if they do, especially if it's midseason, it could cause total chaos for that team because it would just destroy this kid's confidence. And it would have to make everybody look, you know, on that team kind of look around like, whoa, this is the guy who led us to our one victory over the Buckeyes in the last decade, and you're just going to throw him out at the first sign of, of, of trouble. Mm-hmm. You, you know, so I think there's just too much uncertainty with the Michigan quarterback uh, position, and that's why I've got it back as far as I do. Yeah, the, the, this year's team up north feels a little bit like 2015 Ohio State a little bit. Yeah. Like, like what, you know, there's that where are you going to go, how are you going to draw your offense around these guys type of thing. It, and it, they it, are two different quarterbacks, the same mm-hmm. as we had very, in that situation. Yes. And if you game plan for one, you're going to have to stick with them because if you don't and you try to put the other in there and they don't have that same skill set, they're going to fall on their face. Number six, let's keep it up north and talk about Sparty's quarterback, Peyton Thorne. Now, I know a lot of people are a lot higher on him than me. 235 completions on 389 attempts last year. He had 3,240 yards passing, 27 touchdowns to 10 interceptions. But let me tell you why I'm not nearly as high on him as a lot of people in the media. I think he benefited greatly from what was one of the best running games in all of college football. And that's not there anymore. And so I think this, this year's uh, success offensively for Sparty is going to rest on his shoulder shoulders. And I just don't know that he's got the team around him to do that again. And so I have him at sixth, but I could understand why you might have him in the top five. No, I've actually got him at six as well. Uh, you know, I can see him. This is the thing. I can see him duplicating his numbers this year. However, it's for not such a great reason. That's like, cause I think there's going to be so many more opportunities he doesn't have Kenneth Walker there. Um, so I think he's going to be forced to shoulder more of the load. Now, let's not forget, he is an accomplished you know, runner as well. He's not a tremendous you know, dual-threat quarterback, but he is athletic enough to get out there. Wouldn't surprise me to see him put up 250 on the ground and go for a touchdown or two as well. Um, yeah, I've got him in at that same spot at number six. All right, number five. Here's where I have Tanner Morgan. Now, you had a much lower on your list, and I yes. remember that 2019 season, and I remember what this guy put together that year. Uh, 20, 20, yeah, 2019 season, yes. Uh, last two years, not nearly as good as what he did as a sophomore that year, but I think Tanner Morgan, with his experience being a fifth-year senior, understanding that P.J. Fleck offense the way he does – With that running game that is going to be very talented, much like Peyton Thorne did last year, I think Tanner Morgan goes over 3,000 yards, close to 30 touchdowns. And I think Minnesota is going to give the West a run for its money. They are one of my sleeper teams this year to make it to Indy. Um, I got two teams out out West that I think are going to be – be a lot of trouble for a lot of teams in the big 10. And I think Minnesota is one of them. And I think Tanner Morgan's a big reason why. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you there. I think that uh, Minnesota definitely is a contender. You're, you know what? You ready for shock here, Eric? Let's hear I'm going to tell you who else is going to be a contender there this year. And it's the team that kept losing by a point. And that's Nebraska. Mm-hmm. This is where I have Casey Thompson penciled in. I think he has got the ability to be, obviously, he's going to be the best quarterback that Scott Frost has had since being a coach in the Big Ten. Uh, He is a legitimate dual threat guy. He's got the athleticism. He prefers to stay in the pocket, but he can get out and use his feet. You know, I really believe that, you know, Frost, when he was a quarterback, was more of that dual threat, the runner first type guy. But I'll tell you what, I think this guy is somebody that Scott Frost is going to have an easier time coaching because I think Scott Frost played a similar style to this kid but didn't have the talent this kid has. I think that that 
this kid's going to come up from Texas. He's going to play with a major chip on his shoulder after being booted, basically, in place of Quinn Ewers. Good luck with that, Texas. And you know what? I see him having a very, very solid year for Nebraska. Number four, Big Red Sean Clifford from Penn State. So here's the thing. The Penn State fan base is kind of jaded towards this kid and was really hard on him. He played hurt last year. He played through a lot. I know Penn State has not reached the expectations that this fan base fan base expects um, or James Franklin expects. But Sean Clifford quietly had a really good year last year. Listen to these stats. He was 261 of 428 for 3,107 yards. 21 touchdowns to only eight interceptions. That's pretty doggone good, Chris. And, and if not being injured, he would have beat Iowa. Yeah, I agree. I agree 100% with that statement. I think Sean Clifford is going to be probably outside of the Michigan game. I think he is the one quarterback. There's one other quarterback I'm about to talk about. But outside of the Michigan game, on the road, Sean Clifford, he's one of the quarterbacks that – you're going to have to game plan for specifically defensively if you're Ohio State. And and the next is the one I'm going to talk about next. But Sean Clifford's number four for me. I think the kid needs a little bit more respect from that fan base than what he's getting. I agree. And he's going to have to do it this year because I have no confidence in that run game. None. I, I really have, think that he could have a I, tremendous year just because they're not going to be able to run the ball. He might have tremendous stats because they're playing from behind a lot, too. Yes, I truly believe that's going to happen, unfortunately for him. You know, weak run game, but he does have a couple. He does have some good receivers. He's got an okay line when it comes to pass blocking. They do not get the push they need in the run game, though. And I just think that, uh, you know, I think Clifford's going to have a really big statistical year. Would not be surprised to see this guy end up being a day two draft pick. Mm. Okay. Number three guys buckle up for this one. Talia Tagavailoa from Maryland. Are you ready for these stats, Chris? Oh, I, I'm, I'm not ready for him yet. I've got him a little bit higher. Oh, you got him at number two. Do you? I do. Wow. Okay. So Talia known to you and I as two as little brother. That's what we've been calling him for years. You know, started off at at Alabama, transferred over there to Maryland, and has done nothing but really just play. He's balled out. Maryland just doesn't have the defensive talent to keep up with a lot of teams. But listen to these stats last year. 328 completions. That was second most in the Big Ten. 474 attempts. That was number one in the Big Ten. 3,860 yards, again, second most in the Big Ten, 26 touchdowns to 11 interceptions. I've been doing a little bit of studying and digging, Chris, getting ready for the uh, our previews this year. Mark it down. Maryland will beat this year one of the big three from the East, being Ohio State, Penn State, and or that team up north. Now, I'm crossing my fingers and hope to God it's not Ohio State. But here's the thing. We go to Maryland the week before the game. There's your trap game. That's a trap. There's your trap game. That is set up as a trap. Number three. So I'm guessing you got Aiden O'Connell, don't you? I do have Aiden O'Connell at number three. Uh, You know, the senior had a great year last year, completed 71.6% of his passes. 3,712 yards, 28 touchdowns, loses receiver David Bell to the NFL, loses projected number one Milton Wright to ineligibility. But you know what? I really think the kid's got the talent to at least duplicate last season, maybe even improve upon it. Um, So I've got him in at number three. Number two for me is Aiden O'Connell and Purdue. Here's the thing, Chris. I think Minnesota and Purdue are going to challenge for the Big Ten uh, West. I know – I think Iowa takes a step back. I know you've got uh, Nebraska in the mix there. I think it's going to be a three-horse race between Wisconsin, Purdue, 
in Minnesota. I think one of those three is going to be your representative in the and from the West. I know this should be Northwestern's year, according to how things have gone every other year, right? And somehow Patty Fitz might step up and surprise us. I don't think it's going to happen. Those are the three teams from the West I have zeroed in on. And it and a lot of the reason why is because of quarterback play. I think Aiden O'Connell and Tanner Morgan are the two best quarterbacks from the West. And I think they're going to they're going to be there. I, I tell you, Purdue scares me. I know that they have they lost a lot defensively. And I know that that is definitely not their strong point. But if you go back to last year in the horseshoe, that thing was, you know, even though we won comfortably, it was a shootout there, man. Aiden O'Connell really showed me a lot of moxie. That kid's that kid's a gamer. I think he's the second best quarterback in the Big Ten. So I'll tell you what, Eric, I, I don't disagree with you about uh, Minnesota and, and Purdue being in the mix. I'm not even sure I disagree with you about Wisconsin being in the mix. Let me tell you, I'm honestly going to go out here and say it right now. I think that the representative from the West comes in with three losses. I would not be surprised I by think that. They just beat the snot out of each yes. other. They, they, they will. That's exactly what's so, going to happen. Number two for me, he's two as little brother no more. <laughs> we have to learn how to pronounce Talia Tagovailoa because I'll tell Close. you what, he's earned it. Like Talia. Said, 69.2% completions, <laughs> 3,860 yards, 26 touchdowns, QBR of 70.3. And you know what? I think that really puts him over the top this season. He gets Dante Demas back from injury. Yes. He gets Rakeem Jarrett back for another season, yes. who was his number one last season after Demas goes down. This is going to be an explosive offense. He is going to be second in statistics to only C.J. Stroud when it comes to completion percentage, yards, and touchdowns. I think he goes for 70%, 4,000 yards, and 30 touchdowns. He might he might have better stats this year than C.J. Stroud. It's not because C.J. Stroud is, isn't better. I, th- I just think Ohio State's going to run the football more. You know what? I don't disagree with you. But I also think that Stroud's numbers stay the same or even get better. Uh, and it's Talia. Talia, Talia, Talia yeah. whatever. You know, yeah, I know. I I really practiced this week because I was like, okay, I got to get this right. Yes, you're right. Talia. But it's not to his little brother like he said anymore. <laughs> All right, number one, obviously C.J. Stroud, three seventeen. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm positive. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, 317 of 441 for 4,435 yards. Gosh, this stat right here is so sick. 44 touchdowns, this only six interceptions. That's ungodly. That's that is darn near ridiculous. That is PlayStation numbers, yes. man. That's video game numbers. It's just unbelievable. What a talent. Um, yeah, it's obvious. He, uh, Phil Steele, which is the mo- one of the one of, if not the most reputable, um, preseason pr- pronosticator, and uh, that guy has him as the um, second only to Bryce Young um, for uh, All American status. He only chooses one quarterback, so C.J. Stroud was his second team All American to Bryce Young being the first team All American. And that's simply because Bryce won. Bryce Young won the Heisman last year. I don't think Bryce Young wins the Heisman this year. I also don't think that it's going to be C.J. Stroud. But I do think that C.J. Stroud has got probably, as far as odds are concerned, the best chance for Ohio State to unseat Bryce Young as the Heisman Trophy candidate for Ohio State, and uh, at least a, a winner for Ohio State, that is. So what do you think, Chris? C.J. Well, Stroud, right number one. Now. <laughs> I think he improves on the stats a little. I think his, his completion rate goes up to 73%. Okay. I think he's still in that 4,300 to 4,500 range on yards. I think he gets the 50 touchdowns this year. Let me tell you right now, this guy is bringing home a Heisman, a Big Ten title, and a national championship this season. And to quote Mike Golick, you can book it. Well, you know, it's one of those things, man. I – I got a theory. I've been talking about it. I've been toting it. I think I think Ohio State's going to run the football more. I think Travion Henderson goes off against Notre Dame, and that catapults him into kind of the 
Heisman talk week one. And I think CJ Stroud, although he's going to be very steady, good all season long. Um, I th- I just think Travion Henderson is going to be the Heisman winner this year. I do. I just you got know this what? weird this, feeling. This is my thing, Eric. And this is the only reason I disagree with you. Brian Day can't help himself. He's got that <laughs> right. nice shiny way back there holding the football. He can't help himself. He is going to throw that ball. You're probably right. I mean, I you're you're probably right, but I just I, maybe he's learned. I don't know. We'll see. Guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. When we come back. Eric Osbeck is going to rejoin us again. He joined us back at the beginning of the all season, and this time he's going to pre uh, preview the uh, Ohio State season. He's going to break down the schedule for us from his perspective. So make sure you all hang around for that, and uh, and you're going to enjoy it. The OHIO Podcast is brought to you by Mastermind. Mastermind specializes in 360-degree high-definition mobile video mapping, GIS integration, and traffic safety studies. Mastermind cares about traffic safety and keeping you safe on the roadway. Visit Mastermind at OnlineMastermind.com. And welcome back to the OHIO podcast, everybody. And I'm now joined by one of my favorite listeners, Eric Osbeck. It, uh, Eric's come out to a couple of our uh, things that we've had going on. And uh, Eric, first off, happy Father's Day. And how's your summer been treating you? Uh, it's been great. Uh, the spring game with you guys was awesome. That was really fun. Um, so I encourage everybody, like, next year, uh, when we have the spring game uh, OHIO podcast get together, everybody come out for it. It's fun. There was just a bunch of uh, people out just having a great time and playing cornhole and drinking and eating. It was it was a great time. Yeah, we absolutely are going to be doing that again, no, no doubt. And, of course, we'll let everybody know as the season approaches what kind of season kickoff party we're going to have as well. We're working uh, in the works with that as well. All right, Eric, we've turned the page here uh, this summer, and we are now looking ahead to the 2022 season. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about is kind of get your feelings about now that we approach what is uh, quickly, well, quickly approaching, I think 76 days as of today, this recording, if I'm not mistaken, we are just right around the corner. Um, my first question is, number one, how do you think the team has progressed this off season from what you've been able to tell? And number two, what are you most excited to hear about as they break for summer camp? Well, I think, first of all, I think, this year is maybe one of the hardest to predict personnel wise, just because of NIL and, you know, who knows what's going to happen between now and two months from now. I mean, uh, you know, we've had some big names who have left ship. Uh, we've had some big names who want to come here. So, you know, that's the, it's almost like, I don't know, like a a free agency now going on. And Mm -hmm. so it's really hard to predict how we're going to enter the season. If we enter right now, I think, you know, we can, uh, end the season with uh, one loss at the at the most. I think I think there's a really good opportunity to really run the table this year. Yeah, I'm with you. I I mean I I think Ohio State's going to be at least a touchdown favorite in every single game that they play. I think right now the spread against Notre Dame is somewhere around 13 or 13 and a half points, which quite frankly I think. Is, is good. I mean, I, I would lean probably to a two score win for the Buckeyes. 13 kind of seems steep to me. I'd be a little, little way, uh, a little uh, further away from that if I could, if I was going to be a betting man on that. But outside of that, the game at Happy Valley is always going to be tough, but that's a noon game now, which is, I think is interesting. And of course you got the game against the team up North at the end of the season, which I I would think we're going to be favored in that one as well. Of course, they've got a heck of an easy schedule compared to us. And that's true too. But like you were talking about Penn state, I can't remember the last time we played in Penn state during the day. I, I, I don't know the last time that actually happened. I want to say it was in the two thousands, but I, I can remember the nineties playing them in the day, but it's just, yeah. I mean, it's been a long, long time since, since that has occurred. Well, it, <clears> look, it comes back to marquee game every year. I mean, it's like, you know, I think the, the ones that the networks at least look forward to is Penn state, Ohio state and, and Ohio state, Michigan. Um, right. Because just because Penn state, Ohio state, you know, whether it's here at night, I mean, look at the last couple of times we played, 
Um, you know, it's always exciting. It's always a, a nail biter. You know, you have the, the crowd in, in Happy Valley just going crazy with all the white pom poms and the white out and everything else and the tradition behind that. And playing during the day, I think, is going to be very weird. Um, and I just don't think it's going to feel right playing Penn State during the day. <laughs> it's, so, yeah. and, and that might actually work against them. I think so. I, I think they, they feed on the night games. I think they really feed upon, you know, seeing that white out at night and the lights and everything else. And, you know, they have the everything else going for them. And I think during the day, it just might be more of a letdown as far as the atmosphere. I agree. I think if Ohio State jumps out on that, that, that thing could become a a whitewash, for lack of a better term. Oh, I for wish. <laughs> so looking at Ohio State's schedule, let's run down that schedule. How about it? You tell me your thoughts. Maybe give me like, like where do you think there might be a trap game? Um, what do you, what do you appear? What do you think is going to be the toughest game? Tell me what you think here. Okay. So I'll go down each game. You just stop me, um, when you, uh, want to throw something in here. So, uh, Notre Dame, it's going to be the, the first big test for the defense for, for Knowles. Um, I think the Marcus Freeman storyline could give us some locker room fuel, uh, even though he's kind of backtracked, I think, uh, they're kind of using that as, uh, you know, some extra motivation. Um, we've lost, we've won the last four games in the series and, um, we're playing at home. So that'll work to our advantage. But I think we also have to start the season with over a hundred thousand in the shoe. We can't start it off like last year against Oregon where we had what 65, 70,000 people. And even the people that showed up weren't really into it. And it, it was just, you know, it, I don't know. There was something about that game where if we had a bunch of people in that stadium, I think we could, the outcome could have been different. We've had more people show up for spring games than we did that Oregon game last year. And um, if we do win, it'll be one of our first really big signature wins against a non-conference team in, I think, the last 10 years at home. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Uh, let's see. At, I mean, we've lost see, that's to, the thing is at home because we beat Oklahoma at Oklahoma. Then they came back to the shoe and beat us. Same with Texas. Mm -hmm. Um I think our last home game against an opponent like that was maybe Miami um, back in like 2010 or 11, maybe. I mean, because we lost. Yeah. The I mean, there's been a lot of teams that have come in here and we played them hard, but we've lost. But then we've gone to their, you know, field and won. Right. So, um, you know, we need to actually start having some uh, luck here at home first. Agreed. Uh, see, Arkansas State uh, Sunbelt team only had two wins last year. So hopefully we'll blow them out and um, CJ can sit, you know, after the second or third series in the in the third quarter. And I really give our second and third stringers a really good chance to play and um, show us what they got. Um, Toledo um, is Toledo, but they gave us a scare last time that we played them. I think the score was like 25, 22 or 27, 22, something like that. Um, but, you know, if Knowles can get this defense click, and I think we can just really blow them right out of the stadium. Um, see, Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin always just makes my skin crawl. They're, <laughs> they're, they're the team that I just hate to see every year on the schedule. If I see Wisconsin, I'm like, oh, it's Wisconsin. I mean, we, we played them uh, four times now in the Big Ten championship game. Um, they're always there. They're always at the top. They're always just, you know, ready to just, you know, kick your head in. Um, they always play until the clock hits double zeros. Uh, they ended with a bowl win last year. And uh, I think they're looking at us as one of their marquee games next year or this year coming up. Um, it's a rough game, but I think if we can convert third downs and keep them off the field offensively. We'll win it. And I think maybe 10, 15 points spread at the end of the game. But I think that's because we're playing them here and not in uh, uh, Wisconsin. If we were at Camp Randall, I think it would have been a toss-up. Uh, Rutgers, oh, yeah, yeah, Camp Randall's always just – now, I think it was after our 2002 championship year. Uh, was it at Camp Randall or was it here where they beat us? Um, it was a night game, and they just, they just you know, took us to the woodshed in the fourth quarter. I, so. I want to say it was at Camp Randall, if that's I'm not mistaken. Too. And I think they ran a, a couple of kickoff returns or punt returns off for us. And it was just, 
it was just, you know, the, the, no matter what our schedule is, what their schedule is, Wisconsin is always going to be tough. Now, um, crazy enough, we have an eight game winning streak against them, Eric. Which I know, which is it's just crazy to think <laughs> about because j- I just I don't know. Maybe I'm just uh, stuck back in the 90s where it's just, you know, Wisconsin was just always just that that needle in our side where it's just, you mm-hmm. know, the one team on the schedule every year where you're just like, I am not looking forward to playing this week. Yeah, I I, I agree with you. But, you know, recent history says this is a, this is a game we own. And I, you know, I think Wisconsin kind of plays into our former defensive strengths by them running the football so much, because even though we've had some defenses that have struggled, they've not struggled in stopping the run. And so that was Wisconsin's bread and butter. So be very interesting to see if this Jim Knowles defense can can kind of emulate that and making sure that they stop the run. I think they will. I, I think I'm right with you. Um, and we got like I think we start off the year with five home games, too, don't we? Yes, we do. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, Rutgers is the next one. Um, and, you know, coming off of a game like Wisconsin, I think there might be a little bit of a letdown. So I think Rutgers might give us a little you know, give and go within the first couple of quarters, but I think we're going to pull it out eventually in the third and, you know, our talent's just going to, you know, show, show the way, but I think Shiano's going to give us a real fight in at least the first two quarters in that game. Um, Michigan state, a uh, big revenge game for them. It'll be on their field. Um, I'm sure they're going to put up locker room material from the thrashing we gave them last year. Um, but we also matched them win for win last year. I think we were both 11 and two last year. So, uh, and they're always a, a really good team, but they lost, uh, who was their running back last year? Walker, the third. Mm-hmm. That's right. So he was the one that really came in, in the, in the Michigan game and just really just sparked him through the rest of the year. And I don't think they have anybody like that this year. So, um, you know, as much as they want to, you know, just take us to the woodshed at their place, I think, you know, maybe the first quarter might be a give and go, maybe like seven to seven, maybe 10, seven. But I think after that, we might just assert our dominance and just, you know, end it by third quarter. Yeah, they they have an interesting schedule, too. They start off pretty light against Western Michigan and Akron before they take they go on the road to Washington for a night game in week three. Um, I think they still win that. But then they come right back home and take on Minnesota and then go to Maryland. So Minnesota, Maryland, back to back. I would I wouldn't. I'd be shocked if Michigan State is uh, five and zero when we play them. I think they're going to get a loss somewhere there. I think I think you're absolutely right. Uh, well, then we got Iowa, and I don't think we played Iowa since uh, the beatdown, have we? It well, I'll tell you. It the last time we played Iowa was the loss that we suffered in 2018. Right, which was which was the big beatdown. No, 2017. That was 2017. 2017. Okay, all right, all right. Yeah, because because uh, 1920 was uh, Justin Fields, and then which meant 18 was uh, Haskins, so it meant mm-hmm. 17, and that was that was the game after the big comeback against Penn State at home. Okay, and then we, yeah, right. You know, and then we go on the road and we absolutely laid an egg. That's why I always defer to you. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good idea. <laughs> here, here, my Ohio State Google, you know what's going on. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, Indy or uh, Iowa went to Indy last year, and uh, they just pretty much just laid an egg uh, against that team up north, uh, and then they lost the bowl game. Um, so I and I don't think they might have the same fire and intensity and passions they had, you know, last year because I think they really got ahead of steam, and they just you know really believed in their team and themselves. And um, I don't know, I think this year might be a letdown for them. Um, you know, it's going to be here at home, I believe. Yeah, this is going to be a home game for us. And uh, I think Iowa really thrives on their hometown, uh, on the wave, which I think is the mm-hmm. one of the greatest traditions in, in sports today. There, there's nothing that puts a lump in my throat more than watching them do the wave to the children in the, in the tower up there. Yeah, it's, it's just yeah. incredible. I mean, I think that gives them... Uh, a little bit of um, extra home field advantage. Um, so uh, I don't think they have really anything going for them, but they're coming in here, you know, hopefully we can start, you know, 
decking out the stadium this year and uh, just really just let them know that this is Ohio State and uh, send them home with a loss. Uh, Penn State, I think Penn State's going to be our toughest opponent uh, and maybe even a tripping point for us. I think this is where we might have our one loss of the year. Um, even though we've beaten them the last five in a row, they always play as tough, just like Wisconsin. Uh, we've taken them to overtime. They've taken us to overtime. Um, I was there in the shoe when we won in the last, you know, series of the game. Uh, um, you know, I rushed the field with my son and his friends. It was amazing. Uh, you know, we did the same thing to their, at their stadium. You know, we, we took them to overtime and, you know, just so many iconic moments, just in this series alone, just Penn State, Ohio State, ever since they've joined the league, ever since they joined our conference. Um, so it's going to be a great game. I think um, this is probably, again, maybe maybe no more than a 7-10 point win for us. Um, so we'll, we'll see. As far as Penn State's concerned, Eric, so they're going to go one of two ways this year. Now, they have they've got a really, really good recruiting class that they're working on. And they've got some pretty good young guys. But this is all about Sean Clifford. As Sean Clifford goes, Penn State's going to go this year. And they actually start their season off on the road at night against Purdue. That is not an easy game to start your season. No, not at all. It's going to be exciting, too, to watch. Yeah. So if if Purdue can pull the upset against Penn State in week one, do not be surprised if Penn State kind of starts to fall because – Three of their first six games of their season are Purdue, on the road at Auburn, and then on the road in the Big House. So they get, they are at Purdue, at Auburn, and at the Big House in three of their first six games. Then they host Minnesota and Ohio State back to back. It's a meat I, grinder. It is a meat grinder, and I would not be shocked if if after eight games in, if Penn State's not somewhere around. Uh, five and three or four and four. And he just the, the I can't think of the coach. He just signed a ten. James year contract. Franklin. Yeah, he James just signed Franklin. a ten year contract, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he did. So, so yeah, you also have to improve. So who knows? I mean, I I think I don't think they're going to get a win against Auburn, but maybe you know they're looking at Michigan as like, hey, this is going to be our game. You know, this is where we assert ourselves. Let's start our ten year run right here. You know, maybe there's a little bit of uh, extra motivation for him to try to get his team going, but you can always do what your personnel allows you to do. Correct. Um, and like I said, it's during the day. So, you know, that whole, I think that whole whiteout effect is just going to get lost in, in the afternoon sun. And uh, I, I think we could do it. Um, see, then the next ones are Northwestern, Illinois, and Maryland. And you were talking about trap games. I think this, one of these could be a trap game. Um especially coming off of a a hard fought game like Penn state. Like I think it's going to be, I think we're going to get beat up against Penn state. Uh, I think just physically, I think it's going to be a real physical game. Um, And then, you know, it's going to be an emotional win. And then you have three easy quote unquote teams coming in, you know, onto your schedule. And I hope they don't take them lightly because Northwestern, you know, has a big 10 championship experience. Um, He knows how to coach his team. Um, You know, we've, Played them tough both times in Indy. Uh, Illinois has given us headaches. Uh, you can just go back to 2007 with Juice Williams when he came into the shoe and just absolutely just, you know, took care of that fourth quarter for us, even though every single person in that stadium knew who was going to run that ball. We couldn't stop him. So there's, you know, sometimes there's that little one little, you know, thing that you just can't put your finger on every year. And, and sometimes, you know, it's either Illinois. I mean, Indiana's given us problems, you know, the last couple of times we played them also. Um Maryland uh, looked at to 2018. What was it, 52, 51, and they missed the two-point conversion with a wide-open receiver in the end yeah. zone. I mean, I've never been so close to just throttling, you know, people next to me that I have that game. Um, it was that was way too close, and you know, we don't have the same personnel, but still, you know, I, I think Maryland looks back and says, "Hey, you know what? We almost had them. We can do it again." Uh, They beat some high-profile opponents. Uh, They're getting better. They're still not great. But, you know, one of these games just might trip us up. If we don't – if we're not careful, you know, because I think we're at Maryland. Right. And it's the week Uh, before the game. Exactly. And I think, you know, I think like last year when we just beat the absolute tar out of Michigan State, I think there was a big drain on us. Um, 
on, not as fans, but as a team. And that really showed the next week. And, you know, one of these games might be the same thing where we're looking forward to, you know, getting revenge and we just completely trip all over ourselves and, you know, let one squeak away. So, you know, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think one of those three games might be one of the ones where we just fall into a pit. Yeah, Maryland, you got to be careful with. I've been doing some research on them as we begin to prep for our two a days preview of the Big Ten teams and things of that nature. Here's something for you, Eric, which uh, for those of you who are listening to this already, you've already heard this. But next to C.J. Stroud, the quarterback in the Big Ten who had the best numbers as far as passing yards was actually um, Talia Tagavailoa, the quarterback in Maryland. He had over 3,800 yards, 26 touchdowns to 11 interceptions last year. And that's and, amazing for a Maryland team, too. And, and, that's, and that's with two of their top wide receivers injured, mind you, throughout the season. Maryland offensively is going to be scary good. That's going to be a game where whatever the, the point total is, just bet the over because you know it's going to be probably somewhere around 40 to 50 points per team. Um, depending on how good our defense is, obviously, but that one scares me. I'm not going to lie. It's the game before the game. You're in a hostile environment with a team that's got probably nothing to lose at that point. Maybe he's pl- trying to play to get in bowl eligibility. Oh, I, I guarantee you. Yeah, I, like you just said, I, you know, I think they're going to be at five or six games by that time in, in the win column, and, and they're just going to just assert themselves. They want to make sure that they make that strong run into the – into a bowl game. And I, I, you're absolutely right. A hundred percent. Yeah. So I, I believe Maryland's win total somewhere around probably seven or eight this year. I think they're going to, they're going to, they're, they will upset somebody. I don't know if it's going to be Penn state. I don't know if it's going to be a uh, Michigan or Ohio state. Hopefully not, but they will beat one of those three teams this year. I, I I'm almost guaranteeing it because I just think they're going to catch somebody. And like I said, exactly what I said, I said, I, you know, I hope it's not us because either we're looking forward or, you know, whatever's happening that last couple of weeks of the season, you know, it, it, that's a scary time of the year. Um, and then, of course, them. And there's three words, revenge, <laughs> revenge, revenge. Um, all offseason, they've been chirping, uh, telling us how their reign of terror is back and that they're better than us. And, you know, we're never going to you know, due to them again, like we've been doing to them. Uh, in my opinion, they avoided the 2020 game because it would be an absolute embarrassment for them. Um, but, uh, and then I think last year we just had no drive, no passion, no desire. I think it, whatever happened in that Michigan State game, we lost all of that when we went up north to play them. Um, there, you, you could see that there wasn't a desire to win. We were, I don't know, it was just, it was sloppy. You could, just feel that you know the game slipping away um i don't know there was just something about that game last year we just you're watching it going yeah i just don't feel that there's anything going to happen good for us this game mm-hmm. um we need to pack you know 106,000 into the shoe we need to just scream loud enough that they could hear us in arbor we just need to just you know disrupt them uh hold their offense on third downs and convert our third downs ourselves which was our huge problem last year it was a third down and fourth downs that killed us killed us all year long and it killed us during the game um and then uh i think it'll be incredibly close at the end of the third but i hope you pull it out in the fourth win by at least 10 and uh just so they don't have to get those stupid necklaces with a little wolverine you know tiger claw marks on it (laughs) those are cheesy as could be aren't they yeah i I looked at that and i was like you know what that's just motivation for us to just beat them again just (laughs) because goodness gracious there's, I mean, yeah, they, they beat us and they have every, you know, bragging right in the world right now, but just the, the absolute just pomposity of, of some of the, the fans and everything else to just, you know, I just want to really just, you know, assert our dominance again and, you know, put this team back on track. And I, I want to live long enough where we have dominance in the overall numbers as far as this rivalry i think we're down six games overall 
Uh, it's actually back up to I want to say eight now, eight, eight or nine. Yeah, right. it's it, it climbed back up another couple there. Yeah. Well, you so, got one stolen from us from uh, with Trestle's era for first off, so that's the, where the yeah. NCAA don't count that one anymore, which is BS. But then, uh, and then you got last year's. I think so. I want to say they were they're back up to eight. I think we were down to seven. We would have been six. I think if we would have won last year, if I'm not mistaken, but. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, you know, I, I just want to, you know, make sure that, you know, when I, you know, I'm in the old folks home that, you know, Ohio State has that record over them. That's all I want. Um, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha, you, uh, man. Um, now, just kind of some other notes that I have down here. I think um, Ryan Day needs to get a lot of credit. Um, I mean, we went 11 and 2 last year and. You know, say what you want, but, you know, I think, you know, we have such an amazing program that everybody was still upset that we were 11 and 2. I think it's because of how we lost Oregon and how we lost Michigan. Um, but I think that just goes to how great our program actually is that, you know, we're angry at 11 and 2. Um, I think we that's a lot of, you know, just. I don't know, we're, we're just very lucky to love a program like Ohio state that has that kind of, um, I don't know. There's just something about this, this team and, you know, this university and, 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 you know, 11 and two, most schools, you know, they would kill for Mm -hmm. just one 11 and two season in a, in a 10 year spot. And we get it almost every single year. Um, so for him, for Ryan day to look at the defense and say, Hey, we need an immediate change right now instead of having us slip to seven and six or, you know, eight and five or whatever it is for him to do it right now. I, I think that get, that's a lot of, that's a gutsy call. And uh, he needs to get a lot of credit for that. Um, now I think OSU's defense was around 60% efficiency for the defense on stopping third downs. Uh, I think a lot of games we were in the forties, I think against Michigan, we were maybe like 44%. I don't know. It was, it was horrible. Um, so that's one thing that really has to change. And on the other side of the ball, uh, I believe the OSU offense was around 50, 52% um, for converting on third downs. And that's what killed us also. So if we can, if we can turn around that third down, if we can tweak that third down on both sides of the ball, I think we're pretty much unstoppable. I agree. Um, you know, this, the, as we've been talking you know, periodically, and as we obviously dive more into the preseason here of Ohio State, I think it all hinges on how successful this defense is. There's no doubt in my mind that the offense is going to be good enough to win a national championship. The only question is, can the defense improve enough to to at least get some stops to give the offense the opportunity to to build on their leads? And so, I, and like I said, I, I really feel that given Ohio State's offense and how good they are, the opponents that we play, they have to get be successful on third and shorts in order to beat this team. If we can get off the field on third down, like you mentioned, there's no one that's going to beat us in, 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 on our schedule. Absolutely. Nobody. Absolutely. Uh, that, I think that was a difference just, I think, all year long. I think all year long, if you look at the third down efficiency on both sides of the ball, that's that's where – we really, really struggled. I mean, yeah, there were some, you know, problems in the in the defensive backfield, but I think Ohio State traditionally has always had, you know, you know that that's where we always kind of have to really kind of tweak ourselves is the defensive backfield. I think if you go back to any year, you know, fans are going to say, yeah, but our defensive backfield, our defensive back. Um, but you know, you're right that the third and the shorts, the just the third downs all together. We just need to convert. We need to, you know, just push people around. We need to just dominate the line and bend people to our will and just push them like, like we're supposed to, like we're, like we're meant to just push them down, push them around and get them out of our way and get those extra three yards on third down and keep moving the chains. Quick question for you. Um, How many Buckeyes will be invited to New York for the Heisman? And if a Buckeye wins, who will it be? (laughs) Um, I think at least two. I think Trayvon and CJ are going to go. And, you know, it might be CJ this year. You got it on CJ. All right. I have a theory. My going theory is that Notre Dame is going to come out and do everything they can to stop the pass 
Travion Henderson is going to absolutely explode in game one. I'm talking like 200 yards, probably four touchdown type of game on national TV against Notre Dame in prime time. And that's going to catapult his name into the Heisman conversation. And if, uh, if uh, he has the type of year that say like an Eddie George had back in 96, I was then, just going to say, then yeah, we're looking last time, last time we played him at home, you know, Eddie ran all over him. So uh, let's do it again. Uh, that's yeah. Kind of how I'm feeling. Hey, anything else you want to chat about before we take off here? Eric? Um, I'm just excited about the season. Uh, this is my favorite time of year. It gets a little bit cool out and the leaves start to change and you could just feel it. And it just, you could feel football in the air. It's just, there's nothing like it, you know, just waking up on Saturday mornings and you know, you could, if you're walking around campus, you hear the band, you hear people going crazy. It, it's just, it, it's my favorite time of year. There, there's nothing like it. I, you know, I've, I'm 54 years old and every year, when it starts, I just feel like a kid again. It's just, <laughs> I, I, I can't explain it. Everybody who's out there who's a fan knows just the feeling of, you know, preparing for the week and, and watching the game and, and chanting OHIO and, you know, having it going around for 106,000 people and, you know, watching the band come down for the ramp entrance and, uh, you know, seeing the, the drum major take his head all the way and hit the turf with the back of his, in his, the feather on the hat. It's just, you know, chills go through you. Mm-hmm. It's, it's everything. It's not just the team. It's, it's the whole entire atmosphere that just surrounds it. And there's just nothing like it. There's no other team. There's no other college. There's just nothing like it. It's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. All right, guys, that's our show for this week. As always, be kind to one another. I owe someone's OH and St. Carmen, Ohio, with all your heart. Until next time, OH! I owe. Go Bucks. Oh, come, let's sing, oh, highest praise and songs through Alma Mater while our hearts rebounding thrill. And joy which death alone can still. Summer's heat or winter's cold. The seasons pass, the years will roll. Time and change will surely show how firm thy friendship. Oh, how.